Thank you for this interview, dear Minister. So, uh, North Macedonia is now a member of NATO, but uh, what kind of security threats are there that the country and maybe the region uh, should take into the consideration? The world is changing and the security uh, threats are not disappearing, but they're, they're, they're changing in nature, in intensity, uh, and uh, as we have seen, uh, the concept of security now has to, to, to be redefined in a much wider sense. Uh, and therefore, even within NATO, which was you know, the typical organization that deals with collective security, the geopolitical, the geostrategic competition, uh, now shifts to a much broader definition of resilient societies, which encompass much more than the typical military powers that we were used to 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, therefore, we are talking, uh, most of the time, we are talking about threats that are hybrid in nature. Uh, we are talking about the influence additional of uh, cyber attacks, uh, fake news, uh, disinformation campaigns, and none of the typical military threats could go uh, alone by itself. Uh, therefore, as the, as the world becomes complicated, our defense systems need to follow suit and be equally up to the task. In this regard, can you say that the region has moved into more secure uh, status from a couple of years ago? Uh, or yet, uh, maybe there are still issues that they can raise discussion or tension. For example, the non-paper uh, created a big reaction for issues like changing borders uh, or security. Yeah. Sometimes we are overly critical to the situation in our region. If you, if you look at the world today, you will actually see, without relief, <laughs> that uh, uh, no one is now capable of taking security for granted. Regardless of their history uh, and regardless of whether they live in uh, volatile regions uh, or like ours or uh, regions that were considered stable. So security is now, again, an issue that affects everyone. In the case of, of the Balkans, uh, yes, definitely, the Balkans is a much better and safer place to be than 30 years ago, in the beginning of the Yugoslav Wars. Uh, but uh, since then, uh, practically, we have seen that some of the deep-rooted questions or, or dilemmas are still not fully resolved. And this is why even uh, a non-paper that no one wants to take the credit of, uh, of sending it can provoke, uh, I would say, a lot of legitimate reactions. Uh, why? Because all of the countries in the region and most of our citizens have paid a huge price for different attempt, attempts of map drawing. And this is not just uh, the, 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 let's say, the specialty of our generation of politicians. Uh, I recently uh, came, came in contact with a text, an old text from the Austrian foreign ministry in the 1850s, uh, talking about the, the ideas of reshaping the Balkan states to match ethnic borders. Uh, even in the 1850s, they have claimed that these kind of uh, ideas uh, are actually the worst kind of utopian and the most dangerous utopian schemes uh, for, for our region. Why? Because they create confusion, fear and conflict that does not only stay limited to the Balkan Peninsula, but tends to, to, to grow further and uh, entail the, the whole European continent. I, I don't believe in, a, in the simple recipes of let's just re redraw the, the, the maps and everyone will live happily ever after. It's, uh, not realistic uh, and it, the key issue is that it doesn't affect the real risks and the real challenges that the Balkans, the citizens in the Balkans face. These have nothing to do with the way the map is being created but it has lo a lot to do with rule of law, with human rights, uh, with prosperity and economic development. Um, what we have done now is of course we have sensed that everyone was alarmed by the non-paper and I think maybe that's a good thing. Let's, let's uh, reconsider, uh, that, uh, the, the reconsider the reconsider the open issues that need to be solved. The discussions about how can Bosnia be a better, more prosperous state, 
the discussions about the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina, they always went in parallel with the discussion about what will then Macedonia and Greece do with its own name dispute. I think that these three issues have been seen as the frozen conflicts or the frozen issues in the Balkans. And I think that North Macedonia and Greece have shown that there are no frozen conflicts. There are only frozen solutions and a lack of leadership. And uh, this is why I do believe that all of the issues that trouble the Balkans today can be solved uh, with some leadership and a willingness to, to challenge the status quo. So, uh, you, you mentioned the word alarm and then the okay. leadership, which is okay. uh, very important. So, uh, what uh, the societies, the countries can be learn about this recent events, recent debates with known paper, or if I make the question a little bit uh, different, is uh, how can we shape the debates in more different way, more progressive way? Um, what we have done in the last three years uh, is, in my view, the definition of a progressive way of looking at your challenges and the progressive way of looking at your uh, open issues. Um, as a country, we were stuck not only in terms of NATO and EU, but also in terms of domestic political reform and, 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 and uh, even economic prosperity uh, to a large extent due to the name issue with Greece. And we had two options, to wait again, uh, to maintain the status quo and expect that uh, Superman from abroad will come and solve it uh, on our behalf, or to engage in meaningful dialogue. And I think that for the first time, North Macedonia and Greece, uh, and especially their leaders, uh, showed that a European behavior is possible in the Balkans without waiting for others to tackle your, your problems, but with the full, uh, let's say, leadership capacity uh, and initiative to solve the problems yourself. Uh, I do believe that the main value of the PRESPA agreement is not only the fact that it solved a long-standing issue, it was, that it, was it, it, that, that it was predominantly a domestic recipe, meaning uh, the two countries decided to break the, the status quo. And I think that what happened afterwards showed that this leadership can matter. North Macedonia beca became uh, the 30th uh, member state of NATO. Uh, Greece and North Macedonia started uh, increasing their even defense cooperation, which has been non-existent in the past. Uh, but we have also worked uh, very hard on economic and political links. So I think that it brought dividends to both countries. And I, I think that it, it, it shows that even in our region, people might criticize compromises because compromises are difficult to, to accept uh, from both sides, but they appreciate leadership. Uh, we not only uh, solve the problem, we have also moved forward to win consecutive elections, which shows that leadership does matter and that people respect when solutions are being presented on the table. I do believe that North Macedonia is now uh, a better uh, more stable, more prosperous country that can offer uh, a, a certain kind of advantage to its citizens, to the economy and to the investors. Uh, in this regard, how could a new narrative on uh, cooperative security in the region could look like? Not just within the two countries, but maybe a broader one, because uh, uh, Sometimes, as you mentioned, there is a status quo. So how uh, can we change this mentality towards a new progressive one? Uh, I do believe that the, the region needs to first and foremost change in its mentality in, in the sense that we become more responsible for our own actions and for our own decisions. I think that the culture of dependency that was created, I don't know, in history, uh, maybe a result because of uh, interventions by greater powers in the, in the historical periods. Uh, maybe this is, let's say, the excuse, legitimate excuse. But we have to move forward and we have to show that, you know, the new generations have learned their lessons from history and that they're not, not prepared to repeat the mistakes of, of, of history. Uh, the collective security depends on the political will of the countries involved, are we prepared 
to invest in a, in a, in a political debate that will be more than a zero-sum game. Uh, and I, I think that certain initiatives that have been developed before the pandemics uh, were the step in the right direction. More direct contacts, uh, uh, more initiatives that originate from the region rather than initiatives that are just a reflection of EU initiatives. EU in initiatives are excellent, but they should only remind ourselves that it is first and foremost our role to create a more secure Balkans. We have a number of security um, platforms for cooperation and I, I do believe that we need to be more practical and, and create different links because some of the, the challenges which go beyond the typical defense security sector like, like climate change, uh, transport, uh, you know, issues connected to, to uh, uh, economic cooperation, all these issues can uh, create a different narrative and uh, hopefully a new mentality. Uh, are there, in this regard, are there issues that uh, because of the fears or lack of progressiveness, they are not tackled or they are not raised? Uh, uh, is there a mentality, do not touch because it can be worse? Or maybe if you see it from other approach, from today's approach, uh, cooperation can be very beneficial because maybe uh, the fears of the past are not so present here. Uh, in, my, in my view, we have moved beyond some of the fears of the past. But uh, there are times when we are close to making certain breakthroughs and certain political fragments in our societies which prefer the status quo use fake news, use social media, use even media to actually convince everyone that it's the best thing is to stay locked in uh, in your narrative, in your fears, in your concerns, in your comfortable zone. And that zone is far from comfortable for anyone. Uh, you know, even issues on the economic front uh, offer opportunities that we have never seized. For example, the discussion about how do we regulate minimum wage and how do we prevent a race to the bottom when it comes to attracting foreign investors is a, a debate that uh, is still in its nascent phase. Uh, I do believe that there are uh, um, initiatives that can be profitable for everyone uh, where the countries uh, present themselves as a united region that offers different economic opportunities to different investors. But uh, the forces of nationalism uh, have not disappeared and they re-emerge from time to time because they are such an easy uh, way of gaining uh, political relevance. I sometimes think that we, we, are, we also make the huge mistake of uh, paying too much attention to these nationalistic forces. You know, we'll have many conferences about, let's say, economic cooperation, minimum wage. They will never steer the same attention in the media or within the political parties as a non-paper that deals with new maps. I think that we are a bit of a victim of our own experiences from the 90s and we play, we play their hand. Uh, so the, the nationalistic forces in the region can only be one if we provide people with alternatives. And instead of fighting the old wars, we have to actually give, give uh, completely new policy dilemmas, policy discussions. Uh, it won't be easy. We have seen these nationalistic forces re-emerging even in Europe. Uh, so this is why whenever uh, progressive forces prevail, we should not take our victories for granted. We should really keep a close eye on, on what happens in the nationalistic front. And uh, 20 years uh, from Ocrit Framework Ag Agreement and 30 years from the independence, how far we have come and what is the contribution of uh, North Macedonia towards a more uh, secure and uh, stable region, but also within this country? Well, th this is a year uh, where you know, we should take stock of where we were, where we are, and how do we plan ahead. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, telling that we will have to analyze not only the 30 years of our independence, 
which is an important date uh, for every country. As we say, we are way beyond our teenage years, so our behavior should be more mature. But also the 20th anniversary of the, of the OCRIT, of the frame, Framework Agreement, also allows us to, to, to see uh, and appreciate the transformation of our country. Uh, we have moved from a, a country which was a typical security beneficiary of NATO's uh, forces uh, into a country that is now a security provider for NATO, even within our own region. Uh, I, I do think that uh, when we sent our first troops last year to, to K4 in Kosovo, you know, it was a full circle. In a way, uh, we have said, we have learned our mistakes, we have invested in a more stable country, uh, which is uh, also internally more cohesive, and we are able to move forward and offer some assistance to our neighbors. Uh, this assistance is not military, first and foremost. This is more a political assistance, where we provide good examples. Uh, we provide the example that if you are a country with thousands of troops of NATO, it doesn't mean that you're stuck and that you will depend on them throughout your, your, your future. Um, I, I think um, I, I, I use this parallel when uh, the Secret NATO Secretary General first visited uh, uh, our country a few years ago when we were start, restarting our NATO's bid uh, and uh, even he was uh, impressed by, by the dramatic change. You know, I said 17 years ago this was the place for the biggest NATO contingent in, the, in this part of, of Europe. Now we are actually developing some of our NATO capabilities in the same, in the same spot. Uh, we have also uh, been able to prove that enhancing uh, minority rights, enhancing uh, ethnic uh, rights, in enhancing linguistic rights is not a source of uh, division and weakness. It can be a source of, of strength. And this is the progressive idea that has united Europe uh, many years ago. So I do believe that uh, as a country, uh, we have had our shares of difficulties. No one can claim that uh, you know, North Macedonia had a smooth uh, uh, process um, of establishing itself as an independent state. Uh, but I think that due to our combination of uh, composition, history, uh, we have been also a good case study for progressive politics going, going the right way. So uh, North Macedonia can be an example of progressive narrative in the security issues? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, what we mention very often is the fact that we have solved the name issue. Uh, we have moved forward to become a NATO member state. We hope to start accession talks. Uh, depending on whether you will be able to, to, uh, to deliver on its own promises. Uh, but what uh, I should have mentioned as well was that this is, was not just an external process. It was very much a process of internal healing and internal reform. If you analyze all of the reports, you will see that North Macedonia has moved forward on media rights, on, uh, on transparency, on issues such as rule of law, and we have been uh, the only example in Europe where uh, the, 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 the freedom to, of speech and media rights were ass assessed more positively than the year before. So uh, you can have the process of reconciliation with your neighbors in parallel with your own internal growing. Uh, this is why I do believe that North Macedonia is the best example of European policies working even in the Balkans. And this is why it is crucial that the EU delivers and we, we start the, the accession talks uh, together with Albania, the sooner the better. Dear Minister, thank you very much. Thank you.